Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I see that the things that we are developing in the lab ultimately will have an application. The human gastrointestinal tract as such is teeming with millions of bacteria. And it's already been established that a bacteria use quorum sensing as their language. You could take a drop of someone's blood and put it on there and it could tell you the six cardiovascular hormones that are important for diagnosing a heart attack. What we're trying to do is develop tools that will help them manage their disease. I got interested in biosensors early on in my career as a graduate student. I really got fascinated by the idea of being able to um, tweak with um, biological compounds and make them do things for us. Um, so I thought it was fascinating. And at that time, molecular bi biology was really not as advanced as it is now. And, uh, but uh, I really saw the possibilities to take the knowledge that molecular biologists and biochemists had developed and then bring it into analytical chemistry. So basically use molecular biology and genetic engineering as a tool to develop new uh, detection systems. And so that's where my background, which is in medicinal chemistry, pharmaceutical sciences, um, analytical chemistry, and, and molecular biology all came together. And um, I decided to pursue this type of research. The focus of our research in my group is to develop uh, biosensors, uh, responsive drug delivery systems and biomaterials uh, employing genetically engineered uh, cells and proteins. Biosensors have two components to them. One is that they have a feature where they recognize a target compound and when they recognize a target compound, they bind to it. And then they have another component, which is a transducer, which what it does is to emit some sort of a signal in response to the recognition of a target compound. There are many different types of signals. And the type of signal can be an electrochemical signal, or it can be fluorescence, or it can be even bioluminescence. Or it can be a colored signal, just like plain color. Uh, absorbance that is, uh, there, there is plenty of it in nature. Biosensors can be employed in a variety of applications for environmental monitoring, for diagnostics, for um, uh, drug delivery, responsive drug delivery systems, for in the food industry, um, in the defense industry, etc. So there are many applications uh, to biosensors and even, even in, in home uh, type of applications. I've been very fortunate uh, to have a team of very, very, very motivated researchers who have backgrounds in a variety of disciplines. My research focuses mainly on developing protein-based and whole cell-based biosensors, meaning that um, we take proteins from bacteria or other organisms or whole bacterial cells themselves and use them to develop sensors to detect things like, um, for my research, hydroxylated PCBs, which are environmental contaminants, or um, glucose, which is a physiologically important analyte for people who have diabetes. The goal is basically to take biological components from nature and investigate them, to determine how they respond to the analytes that they bind. What I do is I engineer proteins from glow-in-the-dark jellyfish. They're called bioluminescent jellyfish. And I engineer them to be of different colors and different stability, not the jellyfish themselves, but the proteins that make it glow-in-the-dark. And those are used for 
various analytical labels in different fields of science. My research, I'm working with specifically a protein that's found in jellyfish. It's called icorn. And so basically this is the protein that gives off the light that illuminates another protein called green fluorescent protein that is, is the glow that you kind of see in the jellyfish if you were in the ocean and you saw jellyfish glowing. So this protein, again, gives off the light and we use it as a biosensor in giving off the light so we can detect how much is there. So naturally it binds calcium. And so when calcium binds, it gives off a flash of light at 469 nanometers, which is in the blue to green range. And so you can see a blue or green light coming off. And so what I've done is kind of split that protein in half and put another protein in the middle that will specifically bind an analyte of interest for us. So in our case, cyclic AMP or glucose or different analytes like that, when the protein binds it, it kind of folds and undergoes a conformational change. And that conformational change will affect the amount of bioluminescence or light given off by the icorn. Based on how intense the light is, we can determine how much of our specific analyte is in the solution. I work with a photoprotein called icorn, and basically I do engineering of that protein to develop an assay. So my main projects are called molecular switches, where you take two proteins that are completely opposite and you make what you call a designer molecule. So for example, in my case, I just developed a switch where I took the glucose binding protein that binds glucose and I split icorn in half in two halves and attached it to the two separate ends of the glucose binding protein. So when glucose comes in, um, icorn halves come together and then you have a flash, a higher intensity of light emission. So you can develop basically a calibration curve to detect glucose. Well, in my uh, project, we, have, uh, we detect AHLs AHLs are nothing but N-acyl homocysteine lactones. These are signaling molecules for bacteria, for gram-negative bacteria mainly. So we look for these molecules in samples, for example, saliva and stool of patients from IBD. And uh, this uh, analyte is actually uh, sensed by uh, bioluminescence because we, the reporter we use in our whole cell sensor system is Lux cassette, which codes for bioluminescent protein. So this bioluminescence is measured and then we uh, correspond the amount, the intensity of bioluminescence to the amount of AHL present in these samples. We are working uh, with the NIH, the NIHS, um, an institute from NIH, uh, to detect superfund compounds in the environment. So we employ our biosensors to detect for uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, which are extremely toxic in the environment. My environmental sensing project deals mainly with detecting hydroxylated PCBs, which are a um, metabolite of PCBs, which were used widely before the 70s or so in industrial uh, settings and also as uh, transformer filling fluids in electrical transformers. And basically, um, we've engineered Whole, whole bacterial cells that upon exposure to these, um, to these environmental pollutants, they generate fluorescent proteins such that the higher the concentration of the environmental pollutant, the more luminescent protein that they produce and the greater the signal that you see. And so basically we are working towards developing this into a system that you can take the bacterial cells out into the field, simply collect a water sample or something, expose your cells to it, and in a few hours be able to determine whether or not these compounds are present in the environment or not. The main benefit for the environmental sensing work would be um, in people that are interested, basically organizations such as the EPA that are interested in going out into the environment and tracking where contamination has occurred and how widespread and to what levels contamination has occurred at different sites. And for instance, with the hydroxylated PCB work that I'm working on, um, that is mainly a problem in sites called Superfund sites, which are selected governmental sites that are kind of of greater concern for the government to go in and detect how widespread contamination is and to remediate the contamination to try to take care of it. Before you can go into a site and look at ways to clean it up or ways to deal with the pollution that's there, you have to have an accurate measurement of like, what compounds or what species are causing the contamination and how widespread that contamination is before you can develop a plan to kind of deal with the contamination. And also, the system that we've developed, we can also use in uh, blood samples and serum samples. 
And so that kind of gives an extra layer of benefit because um, certain uh, contaminants, especially these chlorinated organic contaminants, have been linked to different types of diseases. And it would be important for um, doctors and for health officials to be able to do studies in which they can quickly and easily correlate the level of some type of pollutant in someone's bloodstream to maybe a, a certain disease flare up or something like that so that they can kind of further investigate these links between environmental contamination and specific diseases and how to maybe work with those and treat those. I'm very excited about what we are doing now with, with the molecular switches, which is that we actually engineer two proteins together that are totally different and have totally different functions to combine their functions and do something for us. We took the protein from the jellyfish that allows for the flash of light to be produced, and we split it in two, in two halves. So now if you split it in two halves, there is not any light being produced. In the middle of the two half, then we put a protein that recognizes glucose. So in the absence of glucose, there is no emission of light. It's like you have a switch and the light is turned off. Now, when glucose is present, the two halves of the protein iocorin that emits the light, the flash of light, come together. And now we see a flash of light coming out. So the switch has turned it on. Developing the molecular switch that I developed, um, it's a bioluminescent molecular switch, and the, it's the first one that we are aware of that's been um, published. Therefore, in my case, I proved a good proof of principle, and you can actually use it as a glucose sensor. So since the, this principle has been proven, this means that you can take and make you know, bioluminescent molecular switches for many other analytes to detect. So iquorin has been isolated from this jellyfish and cloned into vectors, which make it easy to be manipulated with the techniques we use, which is a lot of molecular biology. So we use that protein, and that protein naturally emits light in the blue-green region, so it emits about 470 nanometers, but that's the only light color it emits. So personally, what I'm doing is trying to change the color that emits so we can have, for instance, a red iquorin, a blue iquorin, a violet iquorin, instead of just the one blue-green. And the reason this is important is for two reasons. One, the redder light wavelengths can penetrate skin more easily, so if you wanted to use it for imaging in the future, you could set a camera on someone's skin and probably see the emission from that iquorin, whereas the blue-green doesn't penetrate skin very well. And also it's for multi-analyte detection. So if you only have one color iquorin, you can only detect one analyte at a time within a single experiment. If you had six different colors, you could detect six different analytes at the same time. Some of the applications for these different proteins, they're called fusion proteins or molecular switches, are for like the cyclic AMP one. Right now, if you want to determine how much cyclic AMP is in a cell, you basically have to lyse the cell, which means you're breaking the cell wall and everything in the cell is just kind of spilling out. And then they have different methods for determining the cyclic AMP. But with this method, what we can hopefully be able to do when it's done is inject the protein into the cell. And while the cell is still living, we can monitor how much cyclic AMP is in the cell and where in the cell it is. And so like when a cell is undergoing different processes or there's different stresses from the outside environment on the cell, the cyclic AMP levels may change or may shift to one part of the cell. And hopefully with this bioluminescence or the light being emitted, we can tell where in the cell these processes are going on and also how much cyclic AMP is present in the cell. Um, well, the bioluminescent proteins are the photoproteins from the jellyfish. The most common applications that they're currently used for is immunoassays. For instance, like a home pregnancy test. That's an immunoassay in a very small format. So you have antibodies that are specific to the pregnancy hormone that attach to those. And in the home pregnancy test case, it's a colorimetric change. So those pregnancy hormones attach to the antibodies, and then a colorimetric tag is attached to it that causes you know, the two lines or the one line. But that's not really, really sensitive. If you have a hormone in the blood that is very dilute, you need something more sensitive than that, like a bioluminescent protein. So it's the same general idea. You have an antibody here. You have the protein of the hormone of interest that has your bioluminescent tag attached to it. It competes with 
free hormones that don't have a bioluminescent atta tag attached. So then the more free hormone you have, the less bioluminescence you have. So basically you can get like a linear response depending on how much hormone you have in your blood. So that's the idea of immunoassays. And bioluminescence is more sensitive than colorimetric or fluorescent just because you can see the light flash and you don't have to see a color change on there and because there's a background fluorescence in biological fluid so that causes it to be not as sensitive as bioluminescence. Well the bioluminescent proteins can be used for labels in a variety of things like imaging and medical technology because you need something to be able to see what's going on in the body. So if you want to know where say a hormone is going throughout a body you need to be able to see it somehow so you can tag it with a fluorescent protein or a radioactive protein like they do commonly now or a bioluminescent protein. One thing that's real good about our corn is it has a very low background signal so some of the other fluorescent proteins you have to have an excitation source to see the light come back off but with iCorn you don't so it has a very low background and so by placing there's certain they're called hydrogels and if you place one of those on the end of a fiber optic you can maneuver it and put it in like say through a heart catheter or through some other type of injection method into the body where it will be able to detect at very low concentrations how much of the specific analyte is there just because the detection limit for iCorn is so low and so the fiber optic is just a good way to introduce it into the body and it also provides a way for the light to be collected so the light when it's given off can travel through the fiber optic back to the sensor which could be a couple feet away outside the body. Bioluminescence allows you to detect very very low levels of molecules so now it opens up a totally new field of being able to look into cells and image cells and see when there is a compound present there, there is a switch being turned on and you see exactly the levels of that particular compound in that cell. The smart pill, um, it's an idea that came a few years back, and that was in, is in collaboration with uh, Professor Mark Madhu of the University of California, Irvine. And what uh, the concept of the smart pill is based on is that when you think about how individuals are being medicated nowadays, it's kind of like a little bit random. You're sick, the doctor prescribes a certain dosage of a medicine for you to take or a drug. But this is based on the average of many people taking that drug. It's not really based on you as an individual and knowing how you will respond to that particular drug. So as you know, each of us is different. So each of us will respond to a drug in many different ways. Our metabolism is different. The way we respond receptor-wise to the drugs is different etc. So in reality what we're shooting for is to be able to um, move forward what it is called individualized medicine. So tailor-made ways of dosing people. So the smart pill what it has is has a component of a biosensor that detects a molecule, a marker molecule that will be indicating the disease level of that individual at all times. And in response to those levels, then the pill has a compartment, a reservoir where it contains the drug. So depending on those levels of the marker, then the reservoir will open and will allow the drug to flow through at the needed levels at that particular moment. So through the day, the smart pill will detect the marker several times and dose the patient accordingly. What this will do is that it will avoid underdosing or overdosing an, of a patient and unnecessary side effects that could prove to be toxic. Um, the smart pill also has a component, of course it, it will be, um, as it is called, smart. That means that it has a microchip in there and it communicates the biosensor to communicate the biosensor with the drug delivery portion of the smart pill.
there, there are many different applications that you could think about for the smart pill. It can be for uh, as pain medication, as uh, for endocrine um, applications, hormonal, for example, diseases of the central nervous system like Parkinson, etc. You could use it for many different types or almost any kind of type of um, disease that you could think of that where you need to have a precise dosage and where it is very important not to underdose or overdose the patient. But perhaps one of the um, applications that would be m most uh, valuable, although it's also a very difficult one to uh, achieve, is for diabetes. And that is because there is a fine line between dosing a patient with insulin or with another drug and making sure that the levels of sugar, of glucose, don't go overboard, either you're overdo over um, dosing and you have way too much insulin and then the patient goes in what it's called an hypoglycemia attack that can lead to coma and die, or if you don't give enough insulin, then the patient still can have an attack because it has too much sugar. That's called hyperglycemia. So the smart pill, what it does is detect the levels of glucose in the body of the patient at different times during the day and dosing the patient with the right amount of insulin. Crohn's is a multifactorial disease and it seems to be an inflammatory state which is chronic and has an adverse impact by the severity of the inflammation itself on the various physiological functions of the body. In children, it has a profound effect on how they grow. They lose weight, they don't grow as much, and they start losing their height velocity, meaning that over a period of a um, few years, you could see that their rate of height gain slows down. So it does seem to have a deleterious effect on nutrition and eventually growth itself. I have a daughter who's uh, 19, and uh, she's a sophomore at Princeton now, and uh, she's struggling with Crohn's disease. And um, she has Crohn's since the time she was 13 years old. So how did Dr. Donald and I meet? And there is an interesting story behind that. I met her first in the clinic, and she had brought her daughter along for uh, evaluation in a, in a gastroenterology clinic. And that was the first time I met both the parents and I was very impressed with her intellectual curiosity. Uh, even through the symptoms of her own family, she was able to work through and ask me the questions that made me think. He approached me and he said, well, you are developing all these biosensors for different applications. Why don't we try to think about a way how, where we can help these children that suffer from Crohn's. Because nowadays there is no test that um, patients can use to predict if actually they are going to get really sick and go into a flare up and need to be hospitalized. If I have to look at what bacteria are there in the gastrointestinal tract, we could do a stool culture, but then it only tells us what's the whole overall class of bacteria that's in there, assuming that there are no predominant infections going on. Or we could get very fancy and we could look at RNA probes or look at microsatellite techniques and literally try to tease out every species of the bacteria that are there, which can run into thousands if not millions. We realize that bacteria before they become pathogenic, uh, bacteria become pathogenic once they um, come together, a critical amount of bacteria come together, and then they form what is called a biofilm, and then they become pathogenic. But before that, uh, the way that bacteria talk to each other and arrive that critical mass to form a biofilm, they emit these chemical molecules that are called quorum sensing chemical molecules. So we decided to develop biosensors 
for these uh, quorum sensing molecules and detect the levels of these quorum sensing molecules in saliva as well as in um, the gastrointestinal system of the patients. The quorum sensing molecule gives us an idea where you could monitor whether the bacteria are talking to each other and whether they are at a level where they could start multiplying. And that is a very useful tool in assessing the behavior of bacteria without having to go into tedious techniques. The ultimate goal of this is that once we actually establish that there is a correlation between the levels of these molecules um, in the saliva of the patients and in their intestinal fluids, then we can develop the biosensors that I did talk about, that you can actually incorporate them in paper strips or make very simple type of devices that a patient could use on a daily basis to monitor their status. So basically what we're trying to do is develop tools that will help them manage their disease. Every day I wake up and I have new ideas and I am just so excited. I love what I do and I think that this is something that it permeates and, and everybody in, in my lab is very enthusiastic about what they are doing. The most enjoyable thing about working with Dr. Donnard and, and her research group is that um, she's very passionate about the work that she does. So Dr. Donnard has been very influential in just helping guide me through my graduate career and also in deciding where I want to go to graduate school. She's been very understanding and understands that different students move at different paces and kind of works well with students. Well, working with Dr. Donnard, I think the best part about it is she makes you have a lot of confidence in your scientific ability. Especially in a research group as large as ours, it's, it's important that everyone there is excited about what they're doing and everyone there is really focused on what they're doing and really wants to do well at what they're doing. And I think it helps that she's so passionate and so interested in the work that she does and the work that we do. She's herself very full of life and uh, motivational, or very driven about the work she does, you know. And she's very passionate for all of these ideas or the research she does. So if you've seen her, that she's like always very optimistic. She's been very, a very good role model, I guess, as to how to behave as professional in the science field and also things to pursue. And so she's been very influential in my career and just helping guide me. She really encourages you to be independent. So as independent as you want to be, she'll let you be, which is kind of the whole point of going to grad school is to make you an independent researcher. Whereas I think some professors are more micromanagers, which would not have been a good case for me to get into that lab. She's a role model for all of us, I think, in our lab because she, she's a great example. If I have to say why I love my research so much, I love it because I see that the things that we are developing in the lab ultimately will have an application. I can look into nature, I can imagine things that we can do with what nature has to offer, bring them to the lab and make something useful out of it.